the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on the earth. In him, in Messiah, in the Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the purpose, uh, according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were first to hope in the Messiah might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What I'll do is I'm just going to start making observations and conclusions as I work through here. And let's just unpack this. Uh, the first thing that I noticed here is this statement of the verb is a declaration of, of, of blessedness. So this is the, the, the we, would, we, we, would not state, we would not say an action because verb, it's a state. So the one who is speaking is Paul. And Paul is declaring blessing to who? The object of this is God the Father. We could say this is the subject, or in one sense, it's, it's the object. So subject is the actual grammar, but it's object. This is the, the one receiving the blessing. Okay, and so we have, this is just, I'm saying subject because for those who are grammarians, technically it's, it's the grammatical subject, but, but the, the attribution of blessedness is being given to the object, the one receiving this blessedness is God the Father, number one. And so we can say this main idea here is this declaration uh this is a benediction so if you heard the word benediction a benediction is a a declaration of blessing and so paul is declaring this benediction uh this blessing statement and so if this is if this is aimed at god the father we could say in parentheses that this is a form of of this is a form of prayer because he's communicating to God. God is identified in two ways. That, that was my mistake here. Okay. So this is, this is the, let me, let me, let me correct this here. This is my typo here. There's two ways that the father is being addressed. I mean, that God is being described. Number one, he's number one, he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then number two, we're going to look at this in a second. So my, please forgive me. This is a description here of who he is. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is description one and two. And so we want to define, you're saying what is, you're asking what the definition is. So we yeah, want to do a word study. Yeah. For blessed. When you look at, when you look at the, the word itself, blessed, it's like a state, at least this original word has this idea of, 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 of happiness. I mean, if you're looking at, you're looking at the concept in, in, in scripture, 
going back to the Old Testament, so like blessed is the man, right? So th th these are, again, depending on how you would look at his historically speaking, at least Old Testament blessed statements, which would be the background context for a statement in the New Testament, um, even though it's two different languages, okay? Would be, would be like, would be like happy. That's at, that's at the, at, at the root. But if you're looking at God, and if you're looking comprehensively, it's, it's in this, in this state of treasure is one component, Jesus. Treasure is one component, but it's just in this extreme state of, uh, of, of, of happiness of for sure that's a component but fundamentally it's it's like in this state of extreme uh in all areas there's it's peace there's there's wealth there's prosperity there's honor and, and all of this all this is pointing towards uh praise and worship i i, may, I don't know if that's making sense so when we say when we say bless when we say bless god's name right so so in many ways we're attributing praise or, or, or worship uh, uh honor right so i think maybe that's a maybe that's a a, a better example that kind of get, gets at what we're saying here so what paul is declaring is that god may god is in this totally other category of blessedness of happiness of of praise of worship in this whole di different level. And um, at this point, it's just a statement, right? So, so we can say, we could say, I could say about Kuya Henry, Kuya Henry's in the state, Kuya Henry's blessed. And so, you know, of course that includes offspring, you, you know, that includes maybe he's wealthy, maybe he's honorable in his community. So it's, it's this, this, this whole state, I don't wanna say ecstasy, but maybe, maybe the, the, another word escapes me. But it's in this this level of of otherness, and and so for God though this is completely above and beyond, and so we want to use cat words like worship, praise, honor, and glory. So if I were to say um, God is um, may may glory be given to God, may honor be given to God, may, may, maybe that's that's a similar idea that we want we want to we want to to, to quantify this blessed category, okay. Um, and there's going to be a reason for that, okay? And so the first major point is that now this is a benediction. So this is coming. The actor here is from is the actor is Paul. Paul is the the actor, the one saying this. And so um, he declares that God is blessed, that he is to be blessed, okay? And so um, we'll come back to that. And and the first description that he gives us is. He is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so looking at the church in Ephesus, they were, they were committed to Jesus. They were committed to Jesus as their savior. He was their Messiah, their Lord. But yet God the father is above Jesus, not, not, in, not in value, not in uh, what they would say ontology. They're equal, but there is this, there is this equality and yet there is this unique position that God, God as the Father, and we're going to see what the unique position is. Identifying who God is. Identification of who God is. He is our Father, our Heavenly Father. It's not a command. It's actually just the, the it's like a, an adjective. So he literally just blessing, blessing, the, the, the to be is implied. So literally it would be like, Blessedness to God. That's what he's saying. So, of course, the implication would be if Paul is declaring blessedness to, to God the Father, then if I'm preaching this, I would say that we should follow his pattern and also attribute blessedness to God. So there is a you could you could say there that there is a um, a command sense. Let's come back, let's come back to that though. So let's let's think about following. The number one description is that God is the Father in that He is above, He is above the Lord Jesus Christ, not in value, not in worth. They are they are two different persons of the same God. Okay. But at the same time, He is someone different. And so you couldn't, 
you couldn't say that God is, is below Jesus. Um, what is the relationship between God and Jesus is the question. What's the relationship? And, and the, the answer is that he is his father. This is the, this is the relationship between the two. So that's in, very, very important for us. The relationship. This is, this is, this is a relationship category. God, God, the father is the father. Jesus Christ is the son. And we're going to see how that relationship plays out here. Okay. And so firstly, he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then secondly, he is the one who has, so look at this. So, so Paul is, Divad, this is, this is present tense here. So this is present, Divad, this is present tense. But look at this. This is, this is also a state where we could actually, actually, we should say this. This is a, an act. This time it's an act. This is an action. Um, and, and, and in one sense, maybe, yeah, it's, this is an, an act because he is the one that has blessed us. Okay. So how has he blessed us? Okay. And this is it, but this is a past action. So God's action preceded Paul's praise. Okay. So this action precedes Paul's present praise. Okay. He is the one who blessed us. The object now is, this is the object. And look at this. Look at the, look at the, the circumstances surrounding. In Christ, with every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places. So this, is, this would be a sphere. We're always talking about union. Union with Messiah, right? This is the, the means. Every spiritual blessing. And this is the location. So, is physical blessing right now in view here? Applicational question. It's not physically visible. It's in heavenly yeah. places. Uh, just to, 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 to get really specific here, God cannot bless Anyone post, anyone post fall, God cannot bless them, right? Because we're under the curse. We're under the fall. The only way that we can be blessed is by way of our union with Christ. Do you see that? So, so God's justice will not allow him to bless us unless we are in union with Christ. Is everyone tracking there with him, with, with me? So, so this is absolutely cr critical. So Theologians will speak of the, the doctrine of union with Christ. And so um, we'll unpack that further throughout this, this uh, semester. At this point, we just want to see this as a irrevocable relationship of, of in, in incredibly close proximity. The two examples are head and body and marriage. Okay, so we're blessed in, in, in Christ, in union with Christ, and it's every spiritual blessing. So Think about what are the spiritual blessings and the locations, the heavenly places. So let's list some spiritual blessings now um, that probably is in mind of, that is in the mind of Paul and for sure God. So if you've read Ephesians, uh, if you've looked at other places in scripture, list for me some spiritual blessings. Anyone, anyone. Presence of God in us. Salvation. So, right? So that's what we talked about last week. That's what it means to be saved. To be saved is we escape the wrath of God. And, and we will see that actually play. We saw that play out in Romans. We'll see that play out in Ephesians chapter two. But so we're no longer under God's wrath. That's, the, that's a spiritual blessing now. Rather, we are in, in peace with him. Can you imagine if you said, I have a personal relationship with Duterte, <laughs> past president Duterte. Do you know? It's like, I, have a, I have a personal relationship with President Biden, right? It's, it's, it's an incredible state of blessedness. If you are, maybe not, maybe, I don't know, in the US, I don't know, maybe here, I don't know either. But um, before, if you, were, if, you were, if you had a personal relationship with the king, incredible, right? Um, let's do one more here. Uh, lordship, right? 
are we not, do we not have authority over, over evil forces now? So we have this lordship. We are, we're going to see in Ephesians 2, we are seated now with Christ in the heavenly places. Righteousness, absolutely. Righteousness in Christ. Yeah, so, so justification, you're, you're describing um, multiple, multiple things of these, these would, would describe justification, right? So justification is the act by which our sins are, our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus mm -hmm. and, and, the, and they're, they're, the penalty is paid for. And then positively, we are given Christ's righteousness. And so then we are now declared to be righteous. We're declared to be in the right. So I guess these kind of overlap with this idea of justification. Um, and, and we could go on. But what I'm trying to get at here is just to give you, when you, preach the, when you preach a sermon, when you're teaching through this, this is what Paul means, every spiritual blessing. Now, for sure, Paul is going to highlight as we go through here, but at least this gives us a good start, okay? So, so coming back here, who is God? Why, why is God worthy to be blessed by us? Because he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Okay. Now, the question can then be, why has he done this, Diba? Why, why has he blessed us if we are objects, if we were objects of his wrath, if we are sinners, we're still breaking his law? Because he chose us. It is an election. We're getting to the reason now why he has blessed us. And the reason for this is. This action, the action is he chose us. So I want you to think about this. So this is the actor. This is the object. And look at the qualifications. He chose us again in Christ. So again, you have this, this sphere Or union. He chose us in Christ when? Mangakapatid, brothers, sisters, when did he choose us? Before the foundation of the world. So what's another, so Jesus, what's another word we can say? Before the foundation of the world, what's another word we can use instead of or phrase we can say? Before creation. Yes, before creation. Could we connect the idea of choose here in the idea of um, uh, doctrine of election that you mentioned before? Yes, yes. Okay, no. So we're going to get there. So let's come back to that in a moment. Okay, Jesus, we're going to come right back to that because that's excellent. But I first want to ask the question, what, what, what is the significance of choosing before the foundation of the world? What, what, what would be the purpose of making this statement before creation? What would that seem to imply? What's the significance that that's teaching us? His sovereignty. Okay, yeah, his, his sovereignty. And, and let's, get, let's get down to the nitty gritty. If he's choosing, if he's choosing before the foundation, what does that remove? What, what possibility does that remove? If he chooses us, and specifically the us is not, who is the us? Let's ask the us question first. Who is the us? Someone answer it. Give it to me. Who is the us? In this letter, though, the us is Paul and, and the saints the saints in Ephesus, Diba. The, the believers in Ephesus. Yeah, the saint. Yeah, the saint. Well, I'm just, I'm using saint because that's, that's the address in the beginning of, of the letter. But you could say believers as well. And so then, of course, by way of application, it's appropriate to say the church. Okay? Everyone sees that. So, when you say us, we could say the church, but in the, in the historical context, it's Paul and the saints of Ephesus. So me, what I'm trying to get at is that it's not, it's, in this context, it's not the world. Because or even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. But, but so let's come back to my question now. What does this remove? If he says you were chosen before the foundation of the world, the, the choosing is not, right? The choosing is, is God. God, the one is choose, right? In, in every other context, if I choose ice cream, I choose, I choose Danny to play a basketball game, right? 
I choose Dan to play a basketball game in, in basketball. I'm the one choosing, okay? Now, what do you think the purpose would be of saying before the foundation of the world? We have no participation. We have no role. It's all his. That is correct. And that is hard. That is a hard thing to think about in one sense. In another sense, it's incredibly assuring, right? That it's, it's, it's not left up to me. Think about what incredible love that is. If we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, right? Before Adam fell, <laughs> he chose us. Before Adam fell. So this goes back to the question, we had questions in biblical theology, like, why would God allow this? You know, maybe this is a plan B. No, this was planned. Everything was planned before the foundation of the world. There's a qualification here. Yeah. And, and this, this is not uh, the word us. He chose us. This is not general. This is not general for all humans. Yeah, yes. And there is a yes. qualification because it says, him goes to the saints in Ephesus and Paul. So these are the faithful, uh, the, the faithful yeah. are the saints in Ephesus. So yeah. the qualification is election, maybe, maybe the doctrine of election, maybe. No, so let's write this down here. Our particular love. So this is something for us to think about. God the Father has a general love for all humanity, okay? Even in common grace, even in sending his son. But here is emphasizing his particular love for the saints that he does not have for those, that, um, those outside of the church. God has a particular love. And everyone that he chooses in Christ will be saved, will be, will be redeemed. There's incredible this should change the way you view God. This should change the way we, we view others because this is, this is phenomenal. This is a phenomenal truth. And, and this does not make God the author of sin. This does not make, we're not saying that God is impartial in one sense, in another sense. In another sense, there is this, he set his aff affection on a group of people. And at the end of the day, this is what the text says. So we cannot, we have to accept it. And then we have to, to form our theology around all of, all, all of scripture. Um, the question I want to answer, the, the question about election, okay? The Greek word is, um, uh, the Greek word for elect, uh, uh, the, the Greek word for choose. When we're talking about election in Greek, it's uh, ek loge, uh, which means to choose or to elect. So when we elect officials, Diba, when we elect government officials, we're choosing them. So elect and choose is the same word. The, the Latin word is, the Latin word is electo, electio. <laughs> so that's where we get our English word elect. So you, <laughs> so there's no debate, there's no debate. <laughs> so, so you could say the doctrine of choosing, the, the doctrine of choosing or the, de the doctrine of election. So you guys were, were, were taking, uh, uh, you were sniffing. So King James, Diva, even as he elected us, I think King James, even as he elected us, modern English chose, okay? Now, some people will say that God chose us based on his foreknowledge because before attorneys passed, he looked into the future and saw and saw um, our faith, and then he chose us. Okay, that is an interpretation. Now, that's found in, in Romans chapter 8. And uh, um, without going into those, those issues, we have to look at what Ephesians says on its own. And then we can also wrestle with, with what, what Romans says as well. Because at the end of the day, Romans, Paul wrote Romans and, and Ephesians. At, at this point, I want us to focus on, I don't want us to look at other passages of scripture. Of course, we have to, we have to synthesize. I want us to look at what this text says, because he is going to continue to repeat what is the reason behind this act of redemption, okay? And so if, if Paul says multiple times, he gives a different answer, then perhaps our understanding of foreknowledge is misguided. Perhaps there's a different meaning of foreknowledge 
uh, other than just taking the DVD or just looking like a fortune teller into the future, okay? And, and what I, just right off the bat, what I would say is that um, foreknowledge, uh, the, the, the Hebrew concept of foreknowledge and the, the Greek understanding of foreknowledge is not looking into the future, but, but knowing someone intimately beforehand. The quint example of this is Jeremiah's calling. Before you were born, when you were in the mother's womb, I knew you. That's foreknowledge. Knowing someone intimately before they were born, okay? So that's how I would argue that Paul defines and uses foreknowledge in Romans, but that's for another discussion, okay? Um, at this point, we want to emphasize what the text is saying here, and there's incredible assurance. There's incredible, in these statements here, um, we cannot lose our salvation, okay? So that's where we're going here. Okay, so let's let's continue on here. The next phrase that we have here is that uh, is this phrase here that we should be holy and blameless before Him. So, in in eternity's past, before creation of the world, God chose us in Him, chose the church in Him, and then looking at the, I'll just give you the answer here. Looking at the the relationship, this is providing a purpose. So this. So this structure here um, provides for us a purpose. What is the purpose for God choosing us? That we should be, yeah, but, so before him, uh, it, it could be his eyes for sure. But what I want to say is that this signifies when you're looking at the prepositions in, the, in his presence, in the presence of God, in the presence of God. His plan was in attorney's past to choose us that we should be holy and blameless, okay? And so holy gives this idea of set apart and blameless is perfect. You say, how can that be? We're sinners, right? And so I will always come back to this, in Christ, <laughs> in Christ. And yet there is a time in the future after the resurrection. This, this, is, this is pointing towards the, the, the future when as, I forget who mentioned it, we, uh, uh, um, was it Danny? We, we have resurrected bodies. But notice this here. There is this, there is this theological truth that's happening right now. It's called the already not yet, okay? So we see this in the text. In Ephesians 1, already, already we are set apart. Already we are part of God, Christ's body. Already. Not yet. We're on the way. And so we are not yet perfectly holy and perfectly blameless in the presence of God. We're on the way. And so you know, people will have different ways of defining already not yet. Um, uh, very basic. The already not yet cons construct or theological doctrine says that what is what the, what it, what is in the future has been brought into the present, and so already we are we have God's presence with us. Already we have we are set apart. Already we are in union with the Messiah. Already we have our wrath removed, and we're at peace but we haven't yet fully received that. There is still a yet future fulfillment of it. Not yet, okay? And so that's why you will see at some times it's like, we're already holy. <laughs> but then in other passages, not yet, right? And so, um, and so we see this most perfectly and clearly in the down payment, the, the conclusion of this, the, the down payment of the spirit, right? We already have the spirit, the down payment, but we don't have yet the inheritance, right? Okay, so, so what I want us to see here is a uh, um, big picture to think about is in this text, you are seeing blessedness in the present, holiness in the present, but yet there's a yet future call to us. And so this is very important, non -competent. When we get to the second part of Ephesians, he calls us to be holy right? He calls us to walk in holiness, okay? And so, so in one sense, because we are in union with Christ, we are already holy and set apart, yet we are being, we are being made holy, we are practicing holiness, and it's going to climax in the future 
when we are given resurrected bodies, and this will be true, that we will be holy and blameless in the presence of God. Okay, so this is a lot of information, right? So, so, um, so sanctification is literally, this word here is holy. <laughs> Becoming holy. So part of blessing is, is holiness here yes. and now, and then the, the final holiness in the future. No, excellent. Excellent observation, Sonny. No, it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely true. Part of the spiritual blessing is already we are set apart. Excellent. Yeah. There is a reason and then there's a purpose. And so we can't conflate the two. So some people will say we were only chosen to be holy, but he didn't choose any one of us. And so we want to separate that. There's the act of choosing. And then why did he choose us? Well, he chose us for the purpose that we would be holy and blameless, like you're saying. And so there is two concepts and, and they both stand Stand side by side. Excellent, excellent comment, Sonny. Um, let, let's move on because we are we are on the way with time. Okay. Uh, verse number five. In love, he predestined us. So some people debate where the love goes. I want to say the love is connected with this next phrase. It doesn't come. It it doesn't connect to the preceding, but focuses on here. So we have this phrase here. In love, he predestined us. And so, ah, we got more. <laughs> We've got more actions. Who is the actor? There, there's, there's no faith yet, right? There's no faith. There's no belief. There is, there is God the Father. The action is predestined. What's another word beside predestined that we can use here? What's another word? Anyone? Predetermined. Yeah. Again, we are, we are the recipients. So important, Mangakapatid. We are the objects. We are not the ones acting. We cannot save ourselves. Um, everything we do is in response. There is to be no boasting. First uh, Corinthians says, Christ has become wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, so that no one can boast. If we are to boast, we are to boast in this that we know the lord and so i really want to uh, i really want to stress here that again we are we are merely the objects the recipients of god's blessing this is defining the blessedness that god has done for us okay and so this is of course in a manner of love and it's as henry mentioned it's a particular love that god has for us if we change the us to the world the massive problem that's created is that the whole world doesn't choose. And so th there's no assurance because you can be a part that doesn't choose. Uh, go ahead, Jesus. Go ahead. What, what's your question? Oh, yeah. Sir, could we connect the idea of predestined into the idea of before the foundation of the world? Yes. So these are all subcategories. So I actually connected, yes, so I actually connected here as a, a as another reason here. So this is this is a reason behind the reason. Why did he choose us? Because he predetermined us for something. Okay, does that make sense? The other word for that, sir Tim, is for ordained. Yeah, or okay, no, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, we, we can use the word for ordained as well, yeah. It's the same. It's all the same. It's all the same. It seems like the idea of uh, pre, uh, no, uh, the doctrine of uh, election is very clear here in this aspect, using the word of the word predestined, right? Yeah, yeah. And it becomes and, clearer. Yeah, it becomes very clear. And then also we're going to see the reasons behind even his predestination because, because the claim is that, oh, well, it's just foreknowledge on our future faith. But he's going to give the reason behind the predestination even here. And repetitively, for me, br brothers and sisters, I used to not be someone who really believed in the doctrine of election. And when I studied Ephesians 1, I, I changed. And you could take every other passage of scripture. Ephesians 1 provides for us one of the strongest, if not the most strongest description, not just of our redemption in time and space, but in past and it's incredibly, it gives us incredible assurance, incredible assurance among the top. Yeah, yes, Alonso, because even um, 
I think uh, Millard Erickson uh, in his book yeah, Introduction to to Christianity. Uh, he's mentioned about the individualistic idea of atonement or in the universal idea of atonement that uh, when you say individualistic is that only the few are, are yeah. being saved. And for the universal view, it's the atonement is for all. So, but here, if we, if we look at here in this uh, text, yeah, Sunny mentioned about that uh, the election is, yeah, is really true, that yeah. there is a doctrine of election that God chooses uh, really uh, participant people. And, and atonement too. Atonement is going to be particular. You're going to see atonement here as well. Atonement is going to come up later in this passage. It does mean that when people do believe, it's not because of something inside them. It's because of the perfect work of God and his will and plan. And that's hard in one sense. In another sense, that, that's incredibly reassuring. It's incre I, 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 uh, I can sleep at night because as Henry said, God, or uh, Bo Boy, God is sovereign. He is in control. And I am just, I am just one of his sons that is fulfilling what he's called me to do. That doesn't excuse our action. We should always act. That doesn't excuse us to proclaim the gospel to everyone. Uh, any type of interpretation or application is wrong. Okay. Um, okay, great. Okay. So let's go here. So he is breed. He is foreordained. He has predetermined us for what we have a purpose clause here. Purpose. For adoption, for adoption to himself, to himself. So this is a this is an object. As sons, look at this. Ah, through, again, means through Jesus Christ, through the Messiah. But adoption for sons, maybe it's a little vague. I want to be really strong and clear. We want to say sonship. Sonship and, of course, daughtership. We are sons and daughters. He predetermined. So he chose us before the foundation that we should be holy and blameless. Before the foundation in love, he predetermined our sonship and daughtership through Jesus Christ. So again, we're always coming back to this union with Christ. Now look at this. Is this because of our future faith that he has done this? Is this because we were good people? If ever, if ever you were confused, if ever, you said, no, before the foundation, I don't accept that. Look at this. According to the purpose of his will. His will, excellent translation. I do not actually prefer, I don't like purpose. Eudokia, which means good pleasure. Yes. So, good pleasure. my He's goodness. Good pleasure. <laughs> So King James has this. They get, they get a gold star. Some other translations have this. According to the good pleasure of his will. Brothers and sisters, ultimately God chooses and predestines us uh, for his good pleasure. Intention. Intention also. Intention. Yeah, yeah, yes, intention. And, and, and we, can, we can see that. But, but I really like this word, this idea of good pleasure. Because it really conveys this sense of love and just this affection, this affection and just this this idea of grace towards us. Uh, go ahead, Jesus. You have a question. Yeah, sir. Uh, just to clarify, the good uh, good pleasure to to God the Father. Yes. Through Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. Okay. So uh, idea that uh, somehow in this aspect, if we we use the good pleasure. Or other words, the satisfaction, the the, yeah. the word satisfaction of I like the that, father. Yeah. Somehow, somehow, like they are, we are not equating Jesus with the God the Father. Somehow, they are different. So how what's well, how would you say that, sir? Yeah. So what what I would say is that um, not concerning them eternally or ontologically. Ontologically means in their being. 
but but in their act of redemption. So in the act of redemption, there's specific functions. God the okay, Father plans. Yeah. Jesus Christ is the means that brings it about, and then the Holy Spirit seals. <laughs> so all. So actually. So now maybe you're not in a uh, reformed tradition, but this is what we would call the the um the covenant of the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption is between is between the Trinity. If God plans something, Christ will carry it out, and the Holy Spirit will solidify it. Okay, and so theologians will talk about there must have been a covenant of redemption in the Trinity. That is a plan to save, to save humanity, a, a people for himself. And all three had to agree together. So covenant means agreement. And so in eternity's past, there is this covenant of redemption. The Trinity um, worked together to bring about our salvation. Okay. Very clear, clear, sir. Yeah, now, yeah, 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 I yeah. get it now. Yeah, <laughs> that, no, it, that's okay. good. But 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 many people will say, oh, you know, you're talking about covenant of redemption. I don't see that. Um, the concept is here. The concept is here. And so it's very clear when you actually lay it out. One other thing. So notice here the object of sonship is God. So uh, <laughs> Pastor Henry and Queen Bulba, I don't know if Queen Bulba is there. We were talking about God-centric versus man-centric theology. God-centered theology, we are given sonship, not as we are not the end in ourselves, but God the Father. We are we are made sons and daughters because He is uh, we are for Him, not He is for us. Does everyone see that? Let me write that out. Think about that for a moment. This is a, a great statement. Obviously, he's for us in the sense of that he that his grace is for us. But what I'm saying is, is that this is God centered. This is man centered. Well, so just to be clear, sovereignty sovereignty refers to. Let's just define sovereignty refers to the the reign uh, control of God over creation. So indirectly, of course, it would, it would be referring to sovereignty because we are for the Lord. The Lord is not for the servant. Yeah, but, but here what we would talk about, we would just talk about God-centered, I would say God-centered theology, God-centered God -centered theology here. It's not about us. It's about yeah. him. Yes. And so when we always have the focus upon mankind, we always lose sight. And there it is. This is the end. Look at the final goal. To the praise of his glorious grace. And then here's the bookends with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That's another way of, that's, that's how we could rewrite the witch. With this grace, he has blessed us in the beloved. And of course, it's coming back to, to his action. And there's still more. There's still more. Who is the beloved? Union with Christ. So this is a reference to the Son of God. This is really the first, the first major point in, a, in our study. And so it, you, if you can imagine, you have, this, you have this, this bookend. We talked about bookends before. You have blessed, blessed. So that really it like, it, it encapsulates the first series of why Paul is, giving ble is attributing blessedness to God the Father. So now let's move on to verse number seven. Verse number seven, we have... So highlighting here is we have, this is a, this is again, a state. And we could say this is a, um, a form of possession. So not, not that we're possessed by a demon, but the fact that we have 
we possess something. So that's what I mean by possession. Okay. So uh, we have again a reference to the sphere in Christ. How many times has he said in Christ, through Christ, with Christ, right? So this is really a major theme. The, the Christ as the means by which we are being saved, by which we are receiving all of these uh, blessedness. Um, we are in a state of blessedness. So we have here the sphere in Christ. So notice here, though, brothers and sisters, that I was tempted to write this as the, as the actor, but that's wrong. That's incorrect. We do not, <laughs> we do not redeem ourselves. We are in a state of redemption, but we are the objects and the object that we possess is this idea of redemption and the means by which we have it the means by which we have it is the blood of Jesus. So who atonement. is the, yeah, yeah, atonement. So excellent. No, that's excellent, Jesus. So this is concerning atonement. So we're going to discuss this in a, in a moment. Who is the actor here? Fear, Father, right? Father. Yeah, Hekea, you came out of nowhere. You made it. So Jesus is here. But the actor is still God the Father. So notice that all of God's acts are done through the Son. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the means by which the Father acts. Mm -hmm. But up until now, all the actions have been by the Father. We have been only recipients of the blessedness, of the grace, okay? So... If we were to rewrite this, what I would write this is as the accent is on Christ. Notice here now, we're going to get into this. Okay, we're getting into atonement now. Okay, so we have redemption through his blood. Now, watch this here. This, the forgiveness of sins, of trust, of our trespasses, where, how is this renaming or clarifying? What is this clarifying or renaming in the previous? How does this relate to here? Where is the relationship? Look, look, maybe this is more logical. Forgiveness of sins connects to what idea? So we want to say clarification. So it's clarifying redemption, right? And if we're to use another word for redemption, of course, this is salvation. But of course, the word means to, this word really means to redeem. So you have monetary value going on here, right? Ransom, uh, buying back. Ransom. Buying ransom. 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 Yeah, ransom. Yeah. But notice here, are we being ransomed from Satan in this context? Are we being ransomed from Satan? Danny, go ahead. You're shaking your head. What? From the wrath of God. Yes. Look at this. The forgiveness of our trespasses. So the forgiveness of our trespasses, we could write, write this as sins. This is this is our our penalty to the law for breaking it. So redemption here is forgiveness, forgiveness of that penalty. And so Danny was really correct. The penalty is the wrath of God, wrath of God for it. And notice how this has occurred through his blood. So this atonement, so no, notice here. So this, is, this is, is in one sense, if you understand the Old Testament sacrificial system, it's clear, but it's not explicit. It, a lot of this is implied, but notice here. So what we're looking at here is, if we can just make a big idea here, blood in exchange for forgiveness of sins so this is and then of course the so we have this idea here then of course we have the penalty of the law and so where's koya bull boy is this not then you have a a, a, a substitution area idea here right blood is being exchanged 
Sacrifice is being exchanged, so we can say sacrifice here. So the big idea here is penal substitution. Is everyone tracking there with me? So this is, at first, you wouldn't really see it, but conceptually, it has to be present. It must be present. And so here we have the idea of penal substitution for our sins. Now, up until now, and even in this previous statement here, right? In him, if we identify this as union with Christ, which is correct, can we have a unlimited view of the actual atonement? I'm not saying whether or not it's offered. So, so we, can, we can proclaim the gospel to all people, but, but the, the offer is different than the actual application, right? So in this context here is redemption, is atonement universal or particular? Think about that for a second. Don't, don't jump to an answer, but think about that. Looking at how we've seen in him, chosen in him, redeemed in him. What, what must we say here? This idea of redemption is, is particular or universal? In actual, particular. I'm not saying, it, it has to be particular. This, it must be particular. That's not to say that we don't preach it to all, but, but in actuality, if God has ordained all things, if he's working all things according to the counsel of his will, God's plan at the beginning is going to be clear so that all who all who believe will be redeemed. You see what I'm saying? Like it's, it, you, you can't, there's no need for this, this offer. The, the reason for the offer would be like, well, God doesn't know. If, if God knows, if God plans, who's going to be redeemed. It, it makes no sense for it to be universal. Let me borrow from, I think I, I borrow it from R.C. Sproul. He uses two terms in terms of universal and particular. The gospel is sufficient for all people but it is only effective to the elect. So sufficient and effectual, uh, those terms that uh, he... Uh, oh, just Sonny, I really appreciate that. that you, no, Sonny, you get, the gold star, you get the gold star. Efficient, efficient. No, so, so what Sonny is saying is that um, the atonement is sufficient, but only efficient. Okay, so what we're saying here is, is that if all believed, the, the, the God, Christ's atonement is, is, has the power to cover the, the sins for, for the entire world. That could have been. It's, it's sufficient. It's a, limit, it's, a, it's, a, it's a limitless, incredibly powerful atonement. But in actuality, it's only efficient. It's only effective on those who receive it. <laughs> So, so, so in some sense, we're splitting hairs. And so this is why when people say, I don't like this idea of limited atonement. Yeah, if you're just saying that it's limited in power and it's limited for this. Okay, yeah, no, I disagree with that as well. But if we're talking about sufficiency versus uh, efficiency, or we're talking about what actually happens in, um, in time and space, according to God's plan, it has to be particular. It has to be effective, 100%. Because otherwise, if it was really for everyone and everyone rejected it, very, they very low e efficacy. <laughs> it's the worst COVID drug ever, right? It's so like 1%, 1%. We would say like, oh, why would I take that? It didn't work for everyone else, right? But if it's effective for the elect, 100%, what type of assurance does that give us? That gives us incredible assurance. And again, I want to repeat this until I die. We preach the gospel to all people. We preach the gospel to all people. Propitiation is a concept within penal substitution. But so, oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so we would just say this is, so this is penal substitution. Uh, this is the view of atonement. There's different views of atonement out there. So the Catholic view would not have this. It would be a different view. Um, we're not going to go into all those different terms. But yeah, so propitiation uh we're going into such a depth here. I apologize. But so uh, prop propitiation, you can just write this down. It, it does two things. Number one, it appeases God's wrath and cancels 
sin debt. That's all that means. Propitiation. It, it, it does two things. It, it appeases God's wrath and it cancels the sin debt. And we have that here. Forgiveness of, of trespasses. God's wrath is appeased and the sin debt is gone away. Yeah. So, and then the, the, the whole, the whole idea, the whole concept Jesus, is penal. They would say penal substitutionary view of atonement. That's what they would say. But we could just say penal substitution. And, and penal is, is picking up on, penal is picking up on the law component. It's in the context of God's law. Okay, so we are getting very theological here. I promise that. Though. I promise it would be exegetical and theological. So we're here. We're doing it. Come on. Uh, look at this. Reason. Reason. According to the riches of his grace. So we have redemption. The reason is the riches of his grace. Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Again, it doesn't come back to what we've done. It doesn't come back to that we're good people or that or that we were wise enough to, to have faith in God and my neighbor was stupid enough not to. It doesn't come back to that. It comes back to the riches of his grace. Uh, you know, the amount of re repetition here, you know, Paul is just trying to slap. You know, it's, not, it's not because of you. That doesn't mean we don't have to believe. We're going to see later that we get the seal when we believe. So that does not mean that we do not believe. We absolutely must believe. But when we go back to causes, we do not say it's because of our, of our faith. The cause is God's grace. And look at this. What kind of grace is it? What kind of grace is it? It's the kind that he lavished upon us. I might cry here. I'm sorry. but Limited. It's unlimited. But, but the illustration that I have here is my, 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 my daughter, Carmichael, when you ask her for some ice cream or you ask her for a glass of milk, she always says all the way to the top, <laughs> all the way to the top. And I just, that's God's grace. We, when he says, would you like some milk? I'm going to give you some milk. I'm going to give you some ice cream. I'm going to give it to you to where it's overflowing. Think about that. He doesn't care about the waste all the way to the top. I will, you know, with, when a child speaks like that, you know, she, we can understand what it means. He lavished upon us. <laughs> we can understand that. So we'll just put it here uh, over the top, over the top. I, I don't have this, right? So I just fill it to the top for my daughter. God overflows our cup. Think about the generosity, Eva. You have something that's so expensive and you just fill it all the way up. Let it overflow. That's what this means here. The riches of his grace. And then look at this. He doesn't have to do this. He doesn't have to do this. But at this same time, so this is a time in all wisdom and insight, making known, <laughs> making known. So he could just do it. But look at this, this action, he, uh, this action we could also say revealing, making known to us the mystery of his will. So he reveals to us the mystery. What is that mystery, brothers and sisters? What is that mystery? Well, number one, it's in agreement with his purpose. So this is agreement here. It's in agreement with his purpose. And so what is the mystery of his will? It's going to be this. The mystery of his will is this. Number one, it's in Christ. <laughs> it's in Christ. He sets it forth. He plans it. Look at the content. As a plan for the fullness of time. This is climax of history. And look at the content. The mystery of the mystery is that he will unite all things in Christ to himself. Many translations will have in Christ. So the plan is to unite all things in Christ. So this is big picture, brothers and sisters. His plan, unite 
the mystery of his will. He's done all of these things, not for us. We are not the end. The end is for him to unite all things in Christ. Number one, those things, those things in heaven and those things on earth. Those things in heaven and those things on earth. Isn't that amazing? God's plan of redemption is beyond us. Let me write this down here. God's plan of redemption is bigger than his church. We are fundamental. We're part of it. But it's bigger. He's, he is bringing all of his creation back to himself. And we are the means by which he will do it. Obviously, Christ, because remember, Christ, we're in Christ. And so Christ is the head. We are the body. And so he is doing it, we could say, in one sense, through us. Ultimately, it's through Christ. Okay? Let's move on here. So not only do we have redemption, not only do we have redemption, but we have obtained an inheritance. Who is the actor here? Who is the object, uh, the actor? Uh, Jesus. So close, close. Jesus is, Jesus is the, the means. Uh, God. 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 God the Father. Yeah, God. God is the actor. He has given us an inheritance. He has given us an inheritance. So again, this is, this is, but this is also, this is a possession here, right? We possess this inheritance. So let me ask the question, what, what is this inheritance? So you got an inheritance. What is it? Eternal life. Okay. Eternal life. Is that the spiritual blessing that mentioned up in the previous verse? But... Yeah. So it can include spiritual blessing. It's bigger than these. What else? Yeah, I, I always look at it uh, in in a context of the integrated kingdom. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so you're so you're okay. saying it's kingdom. It's the kingdom. Yeah, it's a it's a kingdom in Christ. You know. Oh. Yeah. So that that's good. What else? Treasure in heaven. <laughs> Treasure in heaven. Okay. What else? Go ahead. Someone else. Enjoy the benefit of being uh, the adopted son. Danny's getting close. Danny's getting warmer. So. The, so if you think of it in the context of sonship, okay, so we're God's son. So think in your context. If you are the son, what does the son get of the father? Inheritance. Inheritance. Okay, but what? But how much? How much? Uh, all. Right? He, gets, he gets all. So all things. So you're going to say, Tim, that's kind of crazy. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We inherit all things. We inherit all things. Now you're going to say, Tim, that, that is, I don't believe you. I don't believe you, Tim. So I'm going to prove it to you right now. I'm going to prove it to you right now. Pastor Titi just popped on the screen, so he's interested. Let's, let's go really quick. Let's go to, um, let's first look at Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through law, but through righteousness of faith. So Abraham and his offspring, they're going to get the world. So you're going to say, okay, but that's, you know, that's, I, I understand offspring as Jews. So that doesn't apply. We're Gentiles. Filipinos are Gentiles. Americans are Gentiles. So let's go to Romans 8, 31, 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with Christ, in Christ, graciously what? Someone finish that for me. Give, Give us all, all things. things. All things. <laughs> so I'm right. <laughs> Think about that. Our inheritance is all things. The universe, all created things. How shall he not in Christ, with Christ, give us all things. I hope you guys get goosebumps. This is like incredible. When I saw this, I was going crazy today. I was like so excited. I'm like, this is nuts. <laughs> and there's other passages. We don't have time to go there. But I want to I want to emphasize in and so you say, well, why doesn't Paul mention here all things? 
It's implied. When you, when you talk about if you are a son, if you're adopted as a son of God, you're going to get, you know, like if, if, if my daughter, my daughters get all of my things, they inherit all of my things. If we are the sons and daughters of God, we get all of his things. <laughs> we inherit everything. So why are we bickering and, and stressed and complaining? We're going to get it all. Of course, it's a stewardship. It's in Christ. So it's not that we would abuse it. But that's what's been promised to us. Moving on here. Having been predetermined. According to his purpose. Again, according to his purpose. So we're getting down to root reasons. Now look at this, brothers and sisters. Again, you could say it's based upon our good. It's based upon our good. It's based upon our faith. Look at this. Look at what he says here. Who is the him? The him is this. Look at this description here, brothers. The one who works. The one who works all things. According to his foreknowledge, seeing whatever it else does and then ordains it. <laughs> no, according to the counsel of his will, completely apart completely apart from his created order. How can he assure us that we're going to get all things? Because he's planning everything. He's working all things according to his counsel of his will. Not what other people do. Not what Satan's doing. Not what we're doing. If ever, if ever we, we felt so like incapable, just recipients over the top, baby. <laughs> He's pouring our cup over the top. It's over the top. King, not, nothing ahead, can Danny. part the plan of God. Yeah. Assurance. You know how some people will whisper and like, you're like, oh my goodness, he's going he's gonna to convince him to change his mind or to change his plan. What this is saying here is that no one can whisper in God's ear. Nothing, nothing in his creation is affecting his plan. It is, it is happening with or without you, with or without you. We're going to close on this. We're a little bit late. I apologize. This is one of the long, this is actually the longest session in this whole chapter, uh, in, in this whole book study. This is the most deepest theological truths. And so um, this is the longest. We won't, we won't be this long in the future. Um, look at this here. Purpose. So that we who were to first hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So here, Paul is talking about, there's, a, there's a, a, a play between we and you. So this is Jews, and this is Gentiles. And, 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 the, and the, 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 the clue here is the, the first part. Is everyone tracking there with me? That, that's the clue. The Jews, right, the whole church, the beginning of the church, from Acts 1 to Acts like 11, it's all Jews. They were the first to hope. Old Testament, they were the first to hope right? They were the first to hope. They were the first to hope in the Messiah. So we would say, okay, Jews, of course, they're, they're part of the Messiah. But notice how the, the, notice how the Gentiles are being included as well. Again, Jewish language now being applied to the church. But look at this. Um, this is the first action. The first action that we have. <laughs> My goodness. We're not scheming. We're not ordaining. All, all we are doing is hoping in Christ. All we're doing is hoping in Christ, baby. We who were the first to hope in Christ might be. Look at the object here. This is God-centered. Our hoping is not for ourselves, but for the praise of his glory. So this is why... The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Westminster Catechism. Glorify God and enjoy him forever. We who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. It, this, the, end, the end goal is not ourselves. So when people talk about who's in and who's out, how can they be out and we're in? That's the wrong question. That's the wrong focus. The focus is on the glory, the praise of the glory of God. That's the focus. 
if we have any other focus on what we do other than glorifying and praising God, we're in a dangerous place. The whole, the whole object of our redemption is for his glory. Here we go. In him also. Number one, when you heard, there's an action. When you heard the word of truth, we're renaming this here, the gospel of your salvation, right? So now he's calling salvation. That's, this is how we know that redemption and, and salvation are the same thing. It's the same type of concept, right? So earlier he's using redemption. Now he uses salvation just without, without thinking. Okay, so, so everyone's tracking there. We can substitute redemption for salvation. Of course, salvation, the, the, the nuance of meaning means something a little bit different. Redemption means something different, but it's, it's describing the same, the same big picture of being becoming sons and daughters, escaping God's wrath, having our sins atoned for. It's talking about the same thing. So number one, we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed. So there we go. We have to believe. We have to believe, brothers and sisters. Number two, action. So when these things happened, look at what happens. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. With the promised Holy Spirit. Who is the actor? Who is the actor of this action? The Father. Yeah. <laughs> we finally got it. We finally got it. The actor is God the Father. God the Father sealed us with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, where is the promised Holy Spirit? Where is the Holy Spirit promised? Someone give me a passage or, 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 or a reference. Where did God first promise the Holy Spirit? I'll give you a hint. It's in the Old Acts Testament. One. No, that's, that's already the fulfillment, brother. Give me Old Testament. Old Testament passage. Joel 2. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to two passages here. Go to Joel Joel chapter 2, 28. So notice this. This is a promise to Israel, a promise to Israel now being fulfilled in the church. So again, we talked about the heavy emphasis of calling the church saints. They are in union with the Jewish Messiah, right? So this is a promise that was to Israel through the prophets about their future. We are receiving it in the church. So again, you know, I'm not jumping to a conclusion yet. I'm really trying to accent the Jewish nature, the, the continuity. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. So there is one reference to the promised Holy Spirit given to Israel, fulfilled in the church. Let's go to another passage. Ezekiel, this is even stronger. Ezekiel chapter 37, 36. Ezekiel 36, verses 24, 24 to 27. Verse 24, you can see it up here. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Promise to Israel, return from exile. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, pure, holy, set apart. And from your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. This is fulfillment. Fulfillment. Now, we would expect this fulfillment here, right? The Jews were hoping in the Messiah. We would expect them to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. The, the, the promise was to them. But, but now it's also be given, it's being given to Gentiles. And so there's this great mystery that's going to be revealed now um, that we'll see later in Ephesians. For now, I'm just building the case. I'm building the case to seeing continuity between the Old and New Testaments, to seeing 
fulfillment of redemption plan. Just to end here, the promised Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the inheritance. The guarantee of the inheritance. The down payment. Another word is down payment. When you put that money down on that property, when you buy that car, you put the down payment. It's not. It's done. Right? Guaranteed. Now look at this. If we understand, let me come back to promise. And let me come back to promise really quick. If we understand the promise, Holy Spirit, as God's presence, this speaks to assurance. God is already with us. And this goes back in the Old Testament to um, Old Covenant and ult ultimately to the garden. Diba? The garden was the place of fellowship from biblical theology. Diba? It's the place of fellowship between God and man. Okay? Looking here. We have, so this is already? Not yet. Ha! Come on. You're seeing it. You're seeing theology. You're seeing how we develop our theology, okay? I really hope that you're seeing this. And so sometimes there's some type of confusion, or maybe it's difficult, but there's a solution, okay? And then look at this. Look at the, the ultimate conclusion, brothers, the ultimate goal of redemption. The praise of his glory. So I you know, I was speaking to someone about this and, and they were talking about the love of God and, and, and how they couldn't imagine um, certain things in, in like eschatology and punishing man. And they said they, they don't see that in the love of God. And, and I brought out to them how that the ultimate goal of our salvation and the ultimate goal in, in eternity is has nothing to do with us. It's all about what brings God the most glory. And, and they looked at me kind of like I was foreign. Like they hadn't heard of that before. And, and so maybe, you know, maybe you'd be tempted to say, oh, that's, that's, that's not so big. That's a small issue compared to our redemption. Brothers, it's not. It's the end of our redemption. And so if we have, if we have any other focus than the praise of his glory, we do not have a God-centered, biblical-centered, Christ-centered theology. This is not about us. The struggles with election, understanding the doctrine of election, is because we are focusing upon ourselves and what we think is fair, what we think is just. This text is just filled with God's work in us, but for himself. And so we come full circle. We come full circle here. I want to close on this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And I think when we understand what he has done for us, Sigurado, there's Utag Dala Divai Henry, there's, we have, we owe everything to God. We owe so much to God. And all we can do, all we can do is say, Blessed be God for what he has done for us. Blessed be God for what he has done for us. If I was preaching this sermon, brothers and sisters, I would give one command. I would say, I would say to the people, we should be blessing the name of God, the name of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit for their covenant of redemption that they have done for us. We are so undeserved of anything. They have filled our cup over the top. He is blessed.